Um, I'm gratified that Lantern and Fells have come together to mix policy and art in what I think will be a really interesting and provocative discussion. Uh, for those of you new to Penn, you have to learn that all events begin with a reference to Benjamin Franklin, our founder. Those of you who have been at Penn, I see laughing in the audience because you know that it's true. Well, when Benjamin Franklin founded the University of Pennsylvania, he used the following words. He said, as to their studies, it would be well if they could be taught everything that is useful and everything that is ornamental. But art is long and their time is short. It is therefore proposed that they learn those things that are likely to be most useful and most ornamental. In the next hour, we hope to make good on Franklin's <laughs> proposal by discussing subjects useful and ornamental, namely economics, theater, and social justice. I'll let you decide which of those are ornamental and which are useful. <laughs> this conversation has been cat catalyzed by the Lantern's current production of Mrs. Warren's Profession by George Bernard Shaw, which many of you in the audience have already seen. If you have not seen it, I encourage you to do so. The production has just been extended for another week and you can get tickets by logging on to Lantern Theater's webpage. And it's, um, it is really a terrific production, um, both in the performance values as well as the substance of the play. This, this evening, we're honored that Mark Blythe has traveled from Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island to be with us as our featured speaker this evening. Dr. Blythe is a political economist whose research focuses on how people cope with uncertainty how randomness impacts, a comp impacts complex systems, particularly economic systems, and why people continue to believe stupid economic ideas <laughs> despite buckets of evidence to the contrary. <laughs> Dr. Blythe is one of the few people with more credentials than Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> He's the Eastman Professor of Political Economy at Brown and holds a joint appointment from the Watson Institute of International Studies in the Department of Political Science. He previously taught at Johns Hopkins, the Copenhagen Business School, and the JFK Institute in Berlin. He did his graduate work at Columbia and his undergraduate work in Scotland. He's the author of several books, including Great Transformations, Economic Ideas, and Institutional Change in the 20th Century, Austerity, the History of a Dangerous Idea, and the future of the Euro. He writes for both academic and popular publications. And when you log on to buy tickets for Mrs. Warren's profession, you can go to YouTube and see Dr. Blythe's lectures uh, as well on, on your computer. Charles McMahon arrived when he was two years old in Philadelphia with the proverbial loaf of bread under his arm, just like Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> Charles is the artistic director of Lantern Theater, a company which he founded in 1994. He's directed over 25 plays at Lantern, including the acclaimed productions of As You Like It by William Shakespeare and New Jerusalem, the interrogation of Baruch, Baruch de Spinoza at Talmud Torah Congregation 1656 by David Ives. He's been nominated twice for the Barrymore Award for Outstanding Direction of a Play for Richard III in 2006 and for Comedy of Errors in 2004. Charles wrote Oscar Wilde favorites, from the Depths, Comedy of Errors. Which, which was produced by The Lantern last season, and he co-created The Lantern's production of A Child's Christmas in Wales based on the poem by Dylan Thomas. That play was nominated also for a Barrymore Award for Excellence in Theater and for the Outstanding New Play in 2014. Charles holds a, B, a BFA from the Tisch School at New York University. I thank you again for joining us this evening, and I'll turn the program over to Charles to moderate the discussion with Dr. Boy. Thank you, Jeff. Um, like uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, George Bernard Shaw was a high school dropout who founded a major uh, educational institution. Uh, in the case of, uh, of Benjamin Franklin, it was the University of Pennsylvania. 
And in the case of George Bernard Shaw, it was the London School of Economics, which he co-founded with other members of the, the Fabian Society in 1895, uh, just shortly after he wrote Mrs. Warren's Profession. So bringing the whole conversation full cycle back to economics and social justice. The, the uh, founding idea in the London School of Economics was that the Fabian Society was a, uh, was a socialist society that was, uh, that was dedicated to the idea of bringing economic justice uh, to Great Britain and uh, the London School of Economics was founded as a, as a means of doing that, uh, to, to, uh, to bring academic rigor uh, to the idea of, uh, of economics, which is something that was fairly new at the time and fairly radical at the time. And I think uh, it's fair to say remains uh, it's very still much is. in demand yeah, it's, it's still now, is, yes. basically, yes. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, the idea that we had in this and the, the exciting thought when, in doing Mrs. Warren's profession is, uh, and in, in bringing uh, Mark Blythe here, was to, uh, to look at those uh, elements of the society, um, particularly with regard to social justice and the relationship of labor and capital. Uh, in Shaw's time, uh, to our own, look at what's similar, what's different, mm -hmm. uh, and what's happened in the meantime. Um, and uh, and that's the, I think that's our, really our jumping off point. Um, we, we have not had a lot of time to talk about, uh, Dr. Blythe just saw uh, the, the production of Mrs. Warren's Profession. Um, Which was a very nice way to spend an afternoon, I have to tell you. <laughs> just just a, a short while ago. Uh, I was wondering if um, we had a conversation about these topics a little bit before you saw the production. Mm -hmm. Were there any things that really jumped, uh, any things that, that really jumped out to you in the meantime uh, after you so, saw it? So just you know, by way of kicking this off, well, first of all, thank you for, for coming. And you know, this is going to be a conversation, but let's try and make it this type of conversation as soon as we can, right? Because otherwise this will get boring very quickly, particularly because you can't see us. <laughs> Which is like, you know, if, if, you know, would it help if we stood when we're actually talking? I think it would because there's a, the thing I've discovered years and years ago is it's bad enough if I stand there because then you have a fixed point reference. And if you remember, you all went to college or school or like some church at one point. And remember when someone's standing there droning on and you have that thing that happens to you will become unbelievably tired. You know that sleep that's the sleep for a thousand years? You find yourself banging your pen into your hand to keep yourself awake, right? It's because it's a fixed point. That's it. So it's bad enough if one of us was to stand there. When you can't see us, you'll be asleep in 10 minutes. So, you know, I'll move around, we'll talk, you can do the same, and we'll go like that, right? So much more comfortable standing up. So anyway, hello. Now, um, let's start with Mrs. Warren's profession in an indirect way. I teach at Brown University. Uh, generally speaking, that's a university that, as we would say in Scotland, has a few quid. <laughs> right? You know, you're not bad off, but we've got a few quid, right? Now, this is something I do with the undergraduates. So I have a class usually between 100 and 200 undergraduates, depending on how many TAs I can find. And uh, it's, on, it's on basically international monetary arrangements, how you pay your bills internationally across time and space, right? It's quite fun. It's called money and power. I call it two of the three food groups. And uh, the other one's sex, but we can't talk about that in class. <laughs> now, I say to them, OK, so how many of you have a price? And they're like, what? Well, how many of you expect to get a job when you leave? And they're like, oh, yeah. right, OK, great. So how many of you are willing to work for $40,000 a year when you leave? So out of 100 students, three of them put their hands up. And I'm like, that's the nonprofit sector. Right there, way to go. <laughs> and how many of you would think 60, which is actually 10,000 above the median wage of the United States, would be an acceptable salary? And I get about 10% of the class are willing to work for this, right? And they keep going up and up. And I'm like, how many of you expect to get 100,000 when you walk out the door, 200 by the time you're in your second year, and a bonus that takes you to half a million by the time you're about 26? It's all guys. It's always guys, and they're sitting at the back, and half of them are athletes, and they're the smart athletes, and they're all going to do that. Now, that's the cross section. Now, here's the kicker. I say to them, why do you have a price on your head? Because if you think about it, for most of human history, people didn't think in those terms. So if you were hungry, you had familial obligations and, and rights and access and all that sort of stuff. And you've decided that your worth 
this thing called a currency. So then just to bake the noodle, I take $10 out of my pocket and I tear it up. I'm Scottish, I don't do 20. But I take 10 and I throw it up in the air. And by this point, they're completely confused, right? Because that was real value. No, it was a piece of paper. So it's about shaking those categories. And what that play does, I think, in a wonderful way, is by inventing these sort of kind of stereotypical class actors. How many of you have seen the play? Right, brilliant. OK, great. So basically, they're all kind of stereotypes apart from Vivi. Because Vivi's a product of this. She's not actually something that comes into it. I'll explain what I mean by this. She's the only one who really takes the system seriously. She buys it hook, line, and sinker that she's going to work hard, she's going to have money, she doesn't care about anything else. And all these people are liars and frauds, right? Because they're, you know, they're all hypocrites, etc. And one of them is basically a pimp, and the other one runs a brothel or several brothels. And they're quite successful, and you could talk about the morality of that. But the interesting thing is she's the most soulless character. At the end of the day, she's the one who's willing to throw her own mother out of the door, right? And she's the one who's most willing to put a price on her head and see that as an end in and of itself. So there's a wonderful critique within Shaw of the whole notion that you're a price, that you're a commodity in a labor market. And that's, to me, the really interesting story, because the way it's played out is the obvious one, right? Is it moral to be a hooker, right? That, that's basically it. Is this an acceptable way of earning money? But what Shaw shows us is if you really take this seriously and you treat everything else as noise and bullshit and artifice, then what you end up with is a pathologically soulless person whose only interest is the pursuit of money. What kind of person would that possibly be? Well, it's the one that we've all become. And it's the one that the entire system encourages to be. So I'll give you a couple examples of this. On the way down the road, I was reading a paper for a journal, because that's what you do. And it's about Wisconsin. And it's about how there's been three waves of, we hate the government, we love the government, we hate the government, we love the government, Scott Walker, etc. And there was a wonderful quote from Scott Walker during his recall campaign, where he said, look at all these people outside protesting. They've all got pensions. They've all got security. You don't. Why should they have that and you don't? And no one thought for a minute, why doesn't everybody have that? Like, why is it you're setting one side against the other to do this? Because pensions are, in some places at least, considered rights, particularly if you've paid into them. It doesn't matter if the fund manager is stupid or people made too big promises. They're a right. And they're also a public good in the following sense. Imagine no one has pensions. You're back to the situation you were in the 1930s, and old people eat dog food in their retirement. Why does that help? It doesn't. So there's all the way through all this stuff, there's a morality about labor market exchange. There's about what labor is for, what, what the end of all this is. And when I see my students, they come into the class and they don't question any of that. They all automatically and axiomatically have a price on their head and in their mind. Wow, that's amazing. And I think what Shaw tried to do and what, re what seeing this play again reminds us is it's not just about how you earn your crust. It's the fact that if you take it really seriously, you kind of lose what it means to make you human. My opening thoughts. <laughs> uh, so I think by now we understand why uh, we were so interested in bringing Dr. Blythe down here to talk <laughs> about the economic issues of the play. Because the, the economic issues are human issues. Well. They are, oh, we'll both Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to get a little bit pinky <laughs> and perky here. So, so these, these are, are human issues. And one of the great things to do from this remove of time, from the 21st century, is to look back at, at this era when this play was written and look at all the things that happened in the meantime that we take for granted, that are just built into the fabric of our everyday lives that weren't there, that mm -hmm. were not there for the characters in this play. Uh, we've all, in some way, derived some benefit from the welfare state. That did not exist in Shaw's time. Uh, it, in, in Shaw's time, uh, workers made anywhere from, uh, from, in this play, it's four shillings an hour is the lowest paid worker and a really well-salaried government worker might make as much as 19 shillings a week, which is roughly $96 uh, 
$98, somewhere in that range, and with about that much purchasing power. How could people possibly live in these circumstances? Well, not very well. They would have to squeeze many people into small areas. Uh, if everybody's making $25 a week and it costs $200 to rent a tenement, then you have to have at least eight of them living there in order to pay the bills. And if you want to eat anything, you're going to have to squeeze in a few more. That's how people lived. Uh, that's how people lived in Shaw's time. And that's how people lived here in the US uh, right up until the point where we started to actually have progressive politics brought to us uh, largely thanks to Republican reformers like Teddy Roosevelt, uh, ironically. But, um, Shaw is trying to, to, to bring about a change in this. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the major change is in the relationship of capital to labor, the power relationship of capital to labor. Mm -hmm. And that's the, so at, in, in Shaw's time, capital is incredibly powerful because labor is incredibly cheap. People are commodities, they're interchangeable. And that changed, obviously, for a, a good long while. We lived in a, in a society where the, the relationship of, of capital to labor was much more equal. Can you uh, expand a little on the- And then uh, we went back. And, and, right, we're going yeah. back, all right. So th there's lots of ways of explaining this. And the, the thing about the, the world, and this is something that sort of my, my ec economist colleagues know but don't like to put in the models, is that it's over-determined. And, and what does that mean? It means there are so many causes pushing in the one direction at a given point in time, they're, they're kind of all true. Some of them are trivially true, some of them are really important, but things can be over-determined. So a good example of this is Trump. Trump is over-determined. Now, it's absolutely true that if you go and sample people who are Trump supporters, you'll find they have more authoritarian preferences than people who happen to be tree-hugging liberals. I'm not shocked by that. Personally, I'm not shocked, right? But does that mean they're all racists? Probably not. But some people want to say they are just all a bunch of racists. Pick one cause and run with it. But then there's the economic explanation. 30 years of declining real wages, the gutting of the heartland, the end of manufacturing surpluses, blah, 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 blah. That's true, right? Well, not if they're all racists. You know, you have to pick. Well, we don't have to pick. I mean, sometimes things are pushing in the same direction, either for good or for bad. Now, you know, let's go back to this for a second. If I had an economist from the 19th century called David Ricardo, right? So David Ricardo uh, wrote about sort of the, the political economy of his time. And Ricardo basically came up with the following amendment to Smith. It's not just individuals trading in markets. There are actually what we would call classes. And one of them is labor, and labor gets wages. And the other one is capital, and capital gets profits. And the other one is land, and land gets rents. And here's the dirty little secret. They're zero sum against each other. So if you have landowners running a country, all they're interested in is keeping out cheap imports of food, making sure that their prices are really high. And when that happens, the ability to labor to eat is compromised, which he doesn't give a damn about the social justice of that. It simply means that capitalists are going to have to pay more so their profits are less. Guess what? Ricardo, when he was in Parliament, passed the Corn Laws, which abolished those tariffs, allowed Prussian wheat to come into Britain. There was a massive drop in the price of wheat, which was effectively a real wage increase for every worker in Britain, and a massive increase in profits for British capitalists. Now, Ricardo plays this out, and he says, so what is it that profit makers do? Well, they invent stuff, they bring it to market, some of it fails, some of it succeeds, that's great, it's all good. But eventually, People figure out what you're doing. And remember, this is in the days before Apple and Samsung are suing each other in court just for fun, right? You don't have profit protection in the same way. So what do you do? You steal each other's technologies. You learn something, I learn something, we figure out how to do it, and then we all start doing it. And then what happens? The price drops. And if the price drops, the profitability drops. And he saw all markets converge on what he called the average rate of profit. And the only way to get beyond that was to go to another country that you hadn't done that to yet. So this is how he was actually an advocate for free trade. Not because of the argument you get today about specialization, et cetera. That's, a sub, that's a, literally in a footnote. It's mainly because if you go there, the profits are still high because no one else has done it yet. Right? Now, this is a very bleak world in which capital is always against labor, et cetera. 
but it contains a microcosm of truth. Because let's say that you're running 10% profitability and you're paying your taxes, you're paying your bills, you're doing the whole thing, that's fine. Other people start coming into the market, you've got competition from abroad, they've got a new technique, you can't access it. You're, you're squeezed, right? So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to have to cut somewhere, you'll lay some people off, but then you get into production problems. You can move it abroad, you couldn't earlier, but like, you know, to that there. You can move from, let's say, the north to the south, because the south has less, less regulations. People forget Trump's main complaint again about trade moving from the, the heartland has actually, most of it went to the south before it went to China. So there's a whole backstory in that. But essentially what I'm getting at is this. Whenever you squeeze labor, they tend to notice. So I was on Italian radio the other day, because I was, uh, which is weird. You know, hello, I'm from Italian radio. Can you talk? Phew, I'm having a coffee. Why not? Um, and I said, you know, what, what's, the, what's the beef? And I said, all right, so a bag of porcini mushrooms doesn't care how much it costs. But labor does. Even my brown students with big fat price tags on their head, they care when it goes down by 20%. So they tend to get together, particularly when they're already organized in factories, and they go, hey, you're like me, even though you're not. I'm Catholic, you're Protestant, you're white, you're black, whatever, I don't care. But notice this, he's still got all the money, and we're getting screwed. So they do things like form trade unions, right? That's how this happens. And they resist, and they strike, and they do lockouts, and they do sit-downs, and they do all that stuff. And essentially what you're doing is you're making life really difficult for capital to make a profit when it's already difficult to make a profit. Now, so long as the state doesn't side wholly with capital in this occasion, what happens is the only way to make a profit is to get smart. So if you notice that big bouts of technological change actually don't happen because of the Schumpeter reason where there's a genius entrepreneur who walks onto the stage and changes the world, it's because labor and capital are doing this at the same time. And what do they do? They go, all right, if we can't screw you guys to get more money, how do we make you more productive? And that's when you get automation. That's when you get Fordism. That's when you get lots of technical changes. And that's what has always historically solved that problem. So by the time you get to the 1950s, everyone celebrates the 50s through the 70s as the golden years. And for you guys, it was pretty golden, right? But you have no idea what it did to Europe. In France, they call this le 30 glorious, the 30 glorious years. In Italy, they call it, you ready for this? It's so cute, il boom. Il boom! How cute is that? It's like a little Cinquecento car. It's so cute, right? But that was a trebling of national income. And what happened was the bottom end of the income distribution went up, the top went like that, and the whole thing moved together, and that happened right across the developed world. That's why it was 30 glorious years, right? Now, why did that stop? Because everybody's benefiting. Well, there's two reasons. One of them has to do with the fact that that system generates inflation. Some of you are old enough to remember the inflation in the 1970s. Now, what happens here is quite interesting. When you make full employment a policy target, which is what you do after the Great Depression, World War II, and the Russians have half of Europe, right? And it's called communism. You kind of have to offer the working class something, which is the welfare state and the GI Bill and all the rest. You go to Berkeley for 50 bucks, all that sort of stuff, good stuff, right? That's there. But then, if I know that I can costlessly move from job to job because there's full employment, that somebody will always give me a job, then that means that the skill, unskilled labor is going to get more expensive over time. But your skilled labor that you really need, holy moly, you're going to have to pay through the ass for this one, pardon my language. So what happens is skilled labor start to realize they're in a really monopoly position and they begin to demand, begin to demand more and more price increases. Now, a wage increases. Now, the only way you can generate profits for that is by doing what? Push up your prices. But if you just pushed up wages and you pushed up prices, nothing's changed. All you've done is create inflation. Welcome to the 1970s. And at that point in time, capital goes, this really isn't such a good deal after all. There was loads of strikes. You remember all the strikes in the 70s? Right across the world. Trade unions were the anathema. We thought they were our partners, but now they're destroying us. Mrs. Thatcher was elected in the winter of discontent. The graves weren't being dug, which is bullshit, by the way. That never actually happened. Rupert Murdoch's papers made that up, right? But nonetheless, they became sort of like the big problem. This is the thing. So they went from being partners in growth to being like the problem. So what do you do? You basically kick your unions to death, which is what happened in the United Kingdom, the United States, and if 
quite a few other places. Not so much Germany. We can talk about why that happened if you're interested. But you reduce the power of labor. And then something else happens. You can finally globalize. See, all the time that you can force them by doing a sit-in to renegotiate, to increase productivity, to put in more equipment, to change the production process, to do a technological fix for growth, is only possible so long as I can't go, we're done. I'm going to Texas. Why are jobs growing in Texas? Because they took them from Wisconsin. And then you go to Texas, and Texas, turns out, isn't actually that cheap because I can send it to China. Now, my favorite little example of this, if you forgive me, is this guy. How many of you have got this guy in your pocket? Lovely, isn't it? <laughs> it is kind of brilliant, right? And even when you take it out of the dumbass case that I've got because I drop things all the time, it looks great, right? So Steve Jobs is a genius. How many of the technology, the six critical technologies in this thing, how many of them does Steve invent? Zero. Can you mention, do you know any of them, sir? You seem to know this story. Touch screens, exactly. Who invented touch screens? United States Air Force, taxpayer dollars, it's called Lodestar. TCPIP, DARPA, secure communications in the event of a nuclear attack, backbone of the internet. What else have we got? GPS, United States Navy, global positioning satellites. You're seeing a pattern here. You paid for all this stuff. Where's your equity share? You didn't get it. We just gave it to the private sector. Because entrepreneurs are so awesome. Yeah, when they put it in a shiny box and we all go gaga. <laughs> but there is definitely value in this, because if you left it to a bunch of geeks in Bell Labs, they would never have thought of this. I mean, that's the honest truth, right? You actually need these people to turn it into commercial products. That's how capitalism works. We were doing this in the 19th century. But here's the difference. Where is this made? And about 12 other countries. Now, here's the interesting thing about the global supply chain that makes this possible, from the touch screen to the chips to the plastic to everything. You can go on a website and calculate how much of this component is probably made by slave labor. Right? Disturbing but true. Because even Apple, who actually are a good company despite their tax dodging bullshit, they really actually try and clean out their supply chains, work with reputable factories, they're not into exploiting the workers, they're, they're, that's not their gig. But they can switch production from one Indonesian manufacturer to a Taiwanese manufacturer overnight and get the specs online in three days. What do you think the margins of those companies are? So what do you think the profits of Apple are? How much of the profitability of this resides in China at the end of the day? Six cents in the dollar. This is what Donald's upset about. 40 cents still goes to Cupertino, right off bat. Now, where do they put their taxes? And they pay an effective rate of 0.02%. In the 1970s, corporates used to pay 20% of taxes. Today, they pay 2%. Who's filling in the gap? Or we're dealing with budgetary austerity, because no one has the balls to call them on it. Now, that's what's changed. You go back to David Ricardo for a minute, you've still got the competition, you have the competitiveness. You have capitalists squeezing labor. But labor was able to resist. Starting in the 1980s, they were no longer able to resist. And at first, we thought it was just those industrial workers. They were bad jobs anyway. We didn't care about that. It's fine. It's good that those people aren't doing that. What are they doing instead? They're working in Walmart. Knock yourself out. Then we got call centers, but you can't move services, can you? And so they started going from Indiana to India. And then after that, well, you know, they can't do that to my kids. My kids have a college education. Hold on to your seats. Of course you can do that. Now, at the end of the day, the reason we do this is not because of the inevitability of something called globalization. It's because of a massive failure of public policy and a massive failure of spine by the people who are meant to represent those people who don't, who represent Apple and Cupertino instead. Now, that brings us all the way back to Shaw. Because remember the play. Who's the guy who stumps up for the lease on the brothel in Brussels? A member of the industrial and aristocratic elite. As they say where I grew up, same shit, different smell. <laughs> so in, in Shaw's time, the uh, the... Uh, the power of capital over labor is that 
virtually everybody in the labor pool is uh, a commodity that is infinitely replaceable. They're all interchangeable. You can plug one guy in. Uh, this guy fails. He's, he drops dead at, on, the, on, on the line. You just bring another guy in. No problem. Uh, as labor gets a certain amount of power, uh, the, you have these large factories and, and uh, industrial infrastructure. It's in place. It's not moving. It's not going anywhere. Uh, labor starts to seize some power over that. They say, we're going to have a picket line here. Nobody's going to cross it. Nobody's going to take my job. We're going to band together and stop this from happening. That is the rule for a good long while. So is it fair to say that the mobility of capital, the ability to, to uh, start up another factory, another mill, yeah, move it. in two weeks, two months, mm -hmm. in, uh, in Kinshasa or Manila, and, uh, and clear out of Wisconsin and all its labor problems and all its high costs. That's the, that's the, uh, the modern equivalent of that from yeah. Shaw's time. It's, I mean, you know, remember, there are always sort of micro level complications in that model, right? So you always had skilled labor. Somebody's always the foreman, right? And as that goes on and as that develops and as complexity and manufacturing processes goes up, you know, think about the United States at the end of World War II. What was the one thing the United States invented as part of uh, wartime research that every women consumer in the world wanted in 1946? Nylons. Not washing machines. <laughs> Nylons. <laughs> Social planners wanted washing machines. I'll tell you an interesting story about Sweden. If you go and uh, I like to do segues and then come back. So uh, in Sweden, they had these uh, two very famous social planners called uh, Arva and Gunnar Muldo. And Gunnar Muldo wrote a very important book about the United States, actually called The American Dilemma, which is basically, I'm Swedish and we're intolerant of foreigners, but you guys have the South. What the hell is that all about? If I encapsulate this, the, the book in, in a nutshell. Uh, so anyway, they were convinced that as modernity continues and all this sort of stuff, we'll need certain things in apartments, like washing machines. Now, here's the problem, and this is why entrepreneurs are fantastic, right? Because they see things that planners can't see. And the, the old Hayekian critique of planning, I actually buy, right, on the, at least on this level. So they imagined that washing machines would always have two tubs. So you get two tubs, just like two sinks. But you're going to need two sinks, so you're going to need two sinks. But you won't really need a cooker, because for some reason, the Murdoch's imagined that we would all be cooking for each other in communal kitchens. So if you go into Swedish apartments built between 1939 and 1959, they have the worst designed kitchens in the world, which also explains why Swedish food is so crap. <laughs> Apart from the one thing you could possibly make in that kitchen, which is Swedish meatballs. Pasta, meatballs, cream sauce, it's all you need to do. Planning run amok, I tell you. Anyway, where were we before my segment? <laughs> Uh, the mobility of capital. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, that's part of the story. But, you know, you, you still have, you know, skilled labor, more complexity in the process, et cetera. And ultimately, you know, th that means that somebody's actually still doing well, right? And, and you know, we still, this is the issue today. Who are you meant to have solidarity with? Right? Und under what circumstances? So go back to Sh one way which is very different now from Shaw's time, right? So if you take the Comcast building and put it on its side, right? and then take all the plexiglass and tape it up and then paint it. You could turn it into a dark satanic mill, right? But the difference with the dark satanic mill is you get to know everyone because you're all dependent on each other. It's one giant open floor. There's stuff whizzing around. The guy you were working to yesterday lost an arm in the machine, right? I mean, there are real visible reasons to be connected with each other. What does your workplace look like? Does it look like water shipped down on acid? Little warrens, little huts, little things. You bob, you do the gopher thing. You know, you come up and have a look and jump down again. You're kept isolated for a reason. It's control. So the way in which jobs have changed over time. Some of you, even very skilled people. So think about very any, any skilled millennials. They're my favorite example of this. The people who have to live on this thing we've invented called the gig economy. Right, so the guy who works for you, right, or who brought us here tonight, is he, what's his name again? Matthew. Matthew, is he here? He's outside, right? Matthew has four jobs. Four. 
right? Now you can say, well, no wonder there's unemployment. Matthew's got all the jobs, right? <laughs> but the reason is none of them pay benefits. None of them give him a pension. And if he's going to pay for an apartment in a city and do the stuff he wants to do, he needs four jobs. Like, what? Huh? Now, you know, all of that happened. We, we weren't, res were we responsible? I don't know, maybe we were in some sense. We weren't paying attention. Now, what's making this happen? Well, partly it's technology, partly it's property rights. Think about Uber. How many of you have enjoyed Uber? I love Uber. I love Uber because taxis are horrible. And the reason taxis are horrible is because it's all about monopoly control of the medallions. And the people who have the medallions bolt them onto shitty cars that never get cleaned, and they run them into the ground using immigrant labor, usually, as cheaply as possible, exploiting them ruthlessly. So in a sense, if you're actually into labor rights, you might like Uber. And that's a weird thought, right? But they don't get any benefits. Well, <laughs> trust me, neither is the guy from Somalia. That's not happening either, the guy in the cab. It's just that it's less visible. But there's a dark side to this. And here's a story with Uber that I heard. And I'm saying this is a story. I was not in the room, simply telling you it's a story. When they were doing the fundraising, they went around, you know, all the venture capital people and funds and stuff. And they said, you know, this is our presentation, this is what we're going to do, this is what the app does, it's going to destroy, the, it's basically disintermediating taxis, right? I mean, it's fantastic. And anyone who's had a bad taxi ride is like, yes, just give me this now, this is awesome, right? You mean you'll actually turn up at 6 a.m. when I need to go to the airport? I won't have to call four times, right? I mean, we've all been there, brilliant, right? And the guy's getting the presentation, they said, well, you know, what's the share? What do you guys get and what does the drivers get? And the drivers get 30%, we get 70%. I was like, whoa, I mean, that's amazing because, you know, I mean, how, how much do you get the actual fare? He said, well, there's a fare, but then there's also this, and there's going to build this whole thing out. And it's like, oh, okay, fair enough. And then he said this, but well, we're going to take them down to 20. Well, why? Because we can. Now, at that point, the guy I knew in the room was like, thanks very much, we're not buying, right, and left. Or at least that's what he tells me. I bet he's invested up the wazoo, <laughs> right? <laughs> But in such a world, right, what are you doing? You're creating that world of Ricardian competition. Now you say, well, Lyft's going to come in. Lyft's going to come in and they'll give you better stuff, right? Come on, you don't have Lyft on your phone. It's bad enough setting up one account. You can't be bothered doing the other one. So, you know, our own laziness and our own lack of thought is creating the conditions in which the gig economy can flourish. And because it's happening to people who are younger than us, who are not our children, we care in the abstract. Well, how much do we really care? Because we benefit from the services. Think about airlines, right? I bet you don't know this one. Um, a lot of American airlines, not that I mentioned in a company, American Airlines, um, <laughs> will pay people only when they're in, in the air. So they get a flat rate allowance for staying on the ground, and you only get paid when you're in the air. What? I mean, you're a full-time employee of the company, right? Well, yeah, but that's why you can fly to Paris for 600 bucks, and you do. So, you know, what was once a solidarity that was very automatic has become a kind of culpability to generalize the others whose faces we never see. And that's why it's so easy to live with such inequality and such injustice. Happy, happy, happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bottle of laughs. You know, I'm actually a stand-up comedian. Like, I mean, I can do this, or we can just cut it and do the comedy, because it's so much more refreshing for everybody. So, you know, when you're bored, just let me know. So. So, putting that to one side, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? <laughs> well, the, the, the play is all before the welfare state. Shaw is, is pushing for, hoping for, uh, lobbying for, uh, working for the creation of a welfare state. Uh, and as you, uh, as you point out, as, uh, as labor gains power relative to capital, it actually ends up being good for everybody, including capital, including yeah. the people in the middle that are neither working in the factories nor uh, benefiting from the, uh, from the increase in share price. Yes. What changed? What, what was the, the trigger point where suddenly we decided, okay, mm -hmm. um, this is all going well, let's stop. Right. Well, I don't think there was any one point. Again, it's over-determined. There's lots of things going on, partly the inflation in the 70s, right? And, you know, I mean, on the one hand, it was great. I mean, if you were old enough to have brought out a mortgage in the 1960s, you're probably paying around 5% on a 30-year fix. 
when inflation goes to 12%, the bank's eating the mortgage. So everybody who did that did the trade of their lives. But debt's bad, remember that one, debt's bad. Inflation's bad, yeah, not if you're on the side of a debt contract with fixed, and fixed rates. So, you know, what changed in all this sort of stuff? So let's think about it this way, the welfare state. So, you know, here's my little pitch for the welfare state. Um, I'm a welfare kid. So my mother died when I was very young. I was brought up by my paternal grandmother. And uh, I went to school that was free. I lived off her pension, which was a purely state retirement pension, not much at all. My father was around, but he was an alcoholic asshole. So occasionally we got handouts and that was pretty much it. That's all true. I mean, that's it, unabashed, right? And I went to school. Uh, I was smart enough to date middle class girls because they went to college and they smelt nice and their brothers didn't beat the living shit out of me. So I thought, there's three signals I can go with. So I was always fast that way. And I learned that like, there might be something else other than the army or prison, which is where most of my ilk ended up. Now, I ended up being an Ivy League professor. So I'm the greatest example of intergenerational mobility you will literally ever see in your life. Right? And because of that, I have paid more in taxes in one year than it cost to educate me for my whole time in school. That, that, that's it. That's all you need to say. This is what this does. It literally pays for itself. What you're doing is you're socializing the costs of skill formation. Firms don't have to pay it. Cut all that away, try and find skilled labor. Well, you can import it. Yeah, it turns out we're a bit funny with immigration these days, right? So how else are you gonna finance this stuff? There are certain costs that sensible societies socialize. How much do we pay as a percentage of GDP in healthcare? 17.9. How much does France pay? 7.9. Are the French dying at the age of 40? May no. That is not happening. So where's all the money going? Well, let's think about it. It's a bit like letting the casinos run the government of Las Vegas. You've got health insurers who are publicly traded companies. What do you think's going to happen? I mean, there's certain low-hanging fruit here, right? But we seem to be unable to grab it. That's the politics of it. So partly there's those sort of things. Something else that's definitely changed in this is the whole ethos of what corporations are about. So the whole notion of shareholder value, you can actually trace this to a paper done by a guy called Jensen in 1965. And what he basically says is this whole notion that like Kodak owes something to this whatever town in upstate New York, because it just happens to have its buildings there. Corporations are nothing more than collections of assets. Even the workers are just assets, because they have skills, and you can bring them in and bring them out. So surely the best way to think about a corporation is that it's a collection of assets which can generate an income. Now, it has a fiduciary responsibility to its shareholders to produce that income. So if you follow this through, the only real purpose of a corporation is to maximize the return to shareholders. And any management that does anything other than that is basically betraying their fiduciary responsibility. So you can do whatever you want. You have no, respons you have no responsibilities outside of that. Well, what you've just done is incentivized corporations just going, we're done with you, we're off, we'll do whatever we can to make a profit, because you've created Ricardian competition inside the firm for a seat on the board and a seat as the CEO. Because if you don't make the sharehold price this high, somebody else is going to make it that high. And it doesn't matter how you do it. Now, you want to know how perverse this gets? Let's think about this. Has the recovery from the Great Recession been strong and robust and broadly shared? No. What's the stock value? What's the Dow index today? Is it 18? Holy moly, that's amazing. Do you remember what it was at its nadir? Uh, when, this, when there was the bust in 2008, how low it went? Seven? Six, five something, I think. It went, oh, it briefly touched that, right? 18, that's amazing. What a recovery, right? There should be money in the streets, right? Well, and then, 
Then the central banks, right, so all these guys who, I've got a slide that I use in talks, and it's a picture of Trichy and Greenspan with giant gold medals around them. And on the next slide, I do Han and Chewbacca with exactly the same medals, right? And it's like, at least one of them blew up the Death Star. But <laughs> it's such a good joke, you cannot not use it, right? So anyway, you know, the central banks are like, it's the other people's money, you can't give it to politicians, they spend, 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 you need to give it all to us, we will be sensible. What have they done? They've chucked 13 trillion euros, dollars, krona, sheep, whatever, into the global economy through various programs called quantitative easing, all the rest of it, blah, 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 right? Buying all this stuff. Now, what have they done? They've boosted the stock market. They've boosted every asset they can find, every bond, every house, every stock, every derivative has been pushed through the roof because you've got super cheap money. Now, if I'm Apple, and I actually make stuff that people want in this environment, right? And I can borrow at basically zero rates, if not negative rates, right? What's my incentive if the only thing that matters is the value of the company's stock? Let's go out and buy the stock. And what have we been doing? What, what, well, we have this puzzle. You pick up the paper, like, investment's falling, but money's cheap. Why do you think that is, Bob? I don't know, Dave. What do you think? Well, why don't we think about this rationally? They've been buying back their own stock. <laughs> Because that way the share price goes up and all the people at the top basically take profits. Welcome to the real world, Neo. Now, once you've incentivized people to do these things, it's very hard to actually unwind that. Right? Because some people are making real money. And some corporates have absolutely no social responsibility towards anything or anybody. And that has actually been enshrined in case law in this country when it's been contested. So what's changed? That's changed. Because you know what? The mill owner at least had a 50-50 chance of having a social conscience, of actually being Owen rather than Ricardo. There was a chance. Now it's illegal for them to do that. That's an incredible shift. Do you want to come in? Let's bring some people into this. That's good, because usually they start as comments and end up as questions. Oh, no, the other way around. That's it. <laughs> in, in America, the conservatives or those that are going to welfare state, uh, to some extent, have been successful because of this underlying ideology of rugged individuals. Now, in uh, contrast that with Europe, and in certain states that, countries that have uh, not resisted, uh, are able to resist doing away with the welfare state. Mm -hmm. Why is it piling on, right? Well, you know, think about Ireland, right? Ireland's as communitarian a country as you can possibly get. I mean, everybody knows everybody else. There's only three. More people live in Brooklyn than live in the whole of Ireland, right? I mean, you know, that, that's scary, but true, right? And, and, and you ever want to terrify an Irishman, right? If you, there's a great story about how you basically defeat Irish burglars. As you go downstairs, not with a gun, but just with the following words, I know your mother. <laughs> that they'll drop everything and just run because it's highly likely you do know their mother, right? Now, here's a weird thing. If you look at their, like, income generation and all this sort of stuff, if you look at the statistics on this, they're as unequal as the U.S. pre-tax. But when you look at it post-tax, it's about as equal as Belgium, which is not a terribly unequal country. Why? Because they actually tax their corporates, or actually they don't. This is the other side of the globalization story. They tax Apple at 12 and a half, or at 0 0.002, right? But they do this with Hewlett Packard, they do it with a whole bunch of different countries. So in a sense, what they're doing is they're able to fund their welfare transfers after tax by using other people's tax dollars. So that's one of the ways in which you can play this game. You can be unequal pre, but equal post. There's other countries that have historically, I'll give you another example on this one. I'll get, sure, I'll get to, I, I know you're there, sir. Um, France is a fantastic example of this. Now, you know, every six months, if you read the Financial Times, there's a big, big piece on why France is about to collapse. Now, the British press have been producing this for 700 years. <laughs> so you should probably, you know, discount it at this point, right? But France actually has very high labor productivity. If you look at the international comparisons on this, they're usually second or third. And in fact, until recently, the country that had the highest labor productivity in the world were the Swedes. Go figure. I know it's long nights and all that, but like, go figure, right? So they're actually quite productive. 
And the way that they choose to spend the productivity is by working less hours, which means in a per capita GDP sense, they earn less money. But then they don't have to hire a nanny to pick up their kids because they can do it themselves. I mean, go back to Shaw for a minute, right? It's not about the morality of what you do. It's what you do with your morality. What are you doing when you're chasing constant GDP growth? Right? And that's essentially where we've done this. And we're driving some parts of the world that way. But when you look into the details, there are other parts of the world that look superficially dissimilar, but actually in practice are actually quite different. Now, you know, whether that goes to not being rugged individualists or whatever, I'm quite willing to entertain the possibility the French are not rugged individualists. I, I'm willing to entertain that possibility. Um, more sort of like devastatingly handsome individualists occasionally. Uh, but yeah, I think there's something more than that going on. And it goes back to that thing called a, not having a catastrophic failure of public policy. Because they didn't. That's, that's basically it. Gentlemen there. Awesome, yeah, I mean, after a while, it gets you in the glutes. That's what it gets me. It's just like, oh, God. Right, so you were talking about Apple approach to China, Pakistan, or wherever. Or more in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So these jobs that I consider hemisphere have just disappeared completely. What do we have? Lawyers and McDonald's. Yeah, and, and, and not, well, you know, well, just the, the old line about Pennsylvania, you've got two oh, cities and something in the middle. Yeah. So then the, the, yeah. so the question then becomes about who owns the robots. I mean, if you're going to go down that road, ultimately this comes to a question about who's going to own the robots, right? So, so I mean, just, just, to, just to riff off this for a second, because I think there's a really important point in what you mean. So here's, well, let's bring the election into this, right? So, you know, they're running neck and neck in the polls, right? Now, here's my short version as to why this works. Because politics is about narrative. It's not about facts. Facts are annoying, facts are inconvenient. Global warming, great example, right? So here's Trump's narrative, and it's not wrong. There's a guy called Gary. Gary's 29 years old, and he's a skilled electrician, and he works in Gary, Indiana, and a big plant. It's 1989, it's the end of the Cold War, it's a bright new dawn, and five years later, the plant shuts down, so do all the parts suppliers, because they were all contingent upon the plant, and basically the entire city takes a massive income hit, and unemployment goes through the roof. Well, being a rugged individualist, he doesn't care, he's never been unemployed, he'll get another job, and all the politicians that came through last time said there's going to be retraining, and he can be a computer programmer and all that, and maybe Gary could, I mean, his 49-year-old co-worker probably couldn't, but maybe Gary could, but guess what, they actually were more interested in tax cuts, so that didn't happen happen. So he bootstrapped himself into a job and he got a job in a call center. And as I mentioned earlier, five years later, that call center went from Indiana to India. And now Gary works for the world's largest employer, which is Walmart for 11.62 an hour when he started off at double that when he was half that age. And every day he reads in the paper how he's about to be replaced by a robot along with all of his mates. And the people who are super excited about this are Wall Street, the people who got all their assets bailed out when there was a crisis, and then the governor of his state stuck it on him because there's a budgetary austerity, you need to cut spending. So you bail out the people with assets and incomes and then stick the cost on the public budget by slashing it. You think people can't figure this sh out? Now, some of that's true, some of that's not true. That's an entirely fictional character, but I completely enraptured you with that, didn't I? <laughs> now tell me Clinton's narrative. Before you get to question, sir, tell me Clinton's narrative. You can't, can you? That's why it's running neck and neck. Because he's tapping into something very, very real. And what exactly are me and my class offering in exchange as an alternative? I don't even know what it is. Sir. Sure. So Bernie, St. Bernie, um, he was very fond of Denmark, which is kind of like Sweden, right? A bit more flexible. The, the main downside to Sweden, and I wrote half a book about Sweden and I spent time there, is it's really boring. God, is it a boring society. 
because everything works. <laughs> no, I mean, everything works. I mean, it's it just like they all deny they drink, right? And then you go down, but I went to Sodom, and there's like half a mile of pubs. How would you explain that? Fins? Oh, nice to be racist about it. That's great. Um, how do they do it? Here's the misconception about all these big Scandinavian welfare states. They charge amazing amounts of tax, right? I mean, they really tax, right? But here's the weirdest thing, and I swear to God, my mother's grave, this is absolutely true. Guess what the most popular government institution in Sweden is year after year after year in service? The tax office. Could you imagine that here, the tax guy is the most popular part of the government, right? Now, how does this happen? It happens because they're actually a public service agency. They employ people who can actually spell and don't salivate and, and try and kill you. Uh, they pay decent salaries. But most of all, they actually try and tell you where the taxes go, for real. So if you want to rent out your place on Airbnb in Sweden, there's actually a form on the website for doing it. They facilitate it. Don't say you can't do it. Just say, we do it. This is it. Uh, do you want us to keep track of these details in case there's a problem with the person who rents? as a third party. Yes or no, you can choose that. So then they pick it, and then you pay your tax on it, right? And then you can go to another part of their website, and it says, this is how much we're taking in an Airbnb in the year. This is how we spend our money. It's all interactive spreadsheets. And like, you can figure out where this is going. And the entire government works on it. You don't get it unless you pay for it. Now, if you want to have world-class education, world-class health care, if you want to have a compressed income distribution, if you want to have a lack of violence in the streets, you have to pay for it. Now, here's the thing. We hate paying for stuff. Now, whether it goes back to the fact that it's like individuals we don't never see or whatever it is, right? We have been skimping on the payments for a generation. Taxes have gone down and down and down and down. And then you get the refrain on the other side. 57 million Americans don't even pay any taxes. Remember Mitt Romney's famous thing? How about we start with you, Mitt, you shit? You pay 15%. I pay 33. What's up with that? When you take his tax trust shelters into account, he pays single figures. The man wants to be president with a straight face. I'm paying 33%. Kiss me. This is ridiculous. But we're all at it. Every single one of us will try not to pay our taxes. How do you generate Sweden if you have a population that simply refuses to pay but wants to consume? So what about the accumulation as well? In what sense? If your, if your tax rate is so high, what opportunity do you have to accumulate Well, here's the difference. The, the, the serious point on this. The richest people in Sweden were the Wallenberg families, and they were rich all the way through. They paid no taxes. Very similar to here. Rockefeller Foundation, which is the sink for the Rockefeller family, in 1971 paid $71 in taxes. So just as Mitt and Romney and I have a relationship, you all have a relationship with people like this. And the reason is income and wealth are actually quite different things. Income is made from paychecks and is taxed as paychecks. Wealth is made from capital gains. And these can be made in stock markets, they can be made in real estate investments, they can be made in currency swaps, and that's real money. And then there's inherited wealth, which is an entirely different category, which actually takes up about two-thirds of all wealth. So when we really talk about wealth, we really have to separate that from income. And when you do, you find out something really amazing about those Scandinavian states. And trust me, I'm not a huge fan. I'd never lived there. I think they're really boring, right? But what you find is that most of the taxes are paid by workers who are paid reasonable wages. They pay really high taxes, and they're the ones who consume the services. The Wallenberg family paid no tax and also sent their kids to Harvard for money. See, the thing is, the rich at the top, the really top, they always have an exit option. It's called cash. And that's what happens when you liquidate wealth. The rest of us live off of income, which is actually something qualitatively different. You don't build wealth from income. You build savings. You might build retirement, but you don't build wealth. Gentlemen at the back. Well, I don't know, shooting lobbyists? Uh, that, just start there. Um, uh, well, there's a, well, you know, it's a, there's, uh, you know, I am being facetious because it's seven o'clock. But um, the way the Germans controlled inflation during the war was quite amazing. So, despite the fact the Allies had carpet bombed them and like they were losing and they had no food and all that sort of stuff, right until the end of 1944, there was no inflation in the German economy. You know why? They shot you if you raised prices. 
Now, again, one, the point I'm making is public authority matters, right? And if you basically create a series of incentives whereby people these days go to Congress because they think it's a good way to, to basically scale upskill in terms of knowledge about the public sector, which you can then go to take to KPMG or one of the K Street firms and then sell it as a commodity so you can go in and privatize it as an asset. Well, you know, that's all the wrong incentives going the wrong way. The problem is not lobbying or special interests. Special interests are democracy, right? It's the fact that we've actually managed to create this wonderful revolving door whereby the public purse is a thing to be expropriated by people who do this as a career. And that's where I'm very much on the populist, if not Tea Party side of the critique in terms of what's happened to professional politicians of both the left and the right. They're disgusting. Then But that's a classic political scientist, economist way of thinking about things. You're thinking about this one cause and one effect. Right? Uh, 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 uh. It's called a classically large endogeneity problem. Because one thing's causing something else doesn't mean it can't be causing something else at the same time, unless you insist logically that it can't, right? So here's my incentive, right? I'm the Pope. Let's take this completely out of capitalism for a minute, right? I'm the Pope. I'm losing members. Now, I represent doctrine. The hardcore would call it dogma, right? I believe this to be the truth. Any Catholics here? Right, what do we call the main, process, main profession of faith in the middle of the Mass? You don't even know. The credo, exactly, thank you. Which comes from the Italian credere, which means? I believe. Belief, faith. You're meant to believe this stuff, right? So here's the deal. All my predecessors have said, gays, you're going to burn. Women, you can't be in the church. Women, know your place. Did I say gays already? Right, exactly, you get the picture, right? I'm losing members. What are my incentives? Everybody loves Francis. He's such a different pope. Now, is that because he really has had a crisis of faith and he's changed the belief, or is it a crisis of membership and he's following the incentives? I think that's a Jesuit. Uh, and also, well, he's a Jesuit. I was, ra I was raised by Jesuits intellectually, which means I don't believe in everything and I fear nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, one more and then we'll go. The Fabians, I think, were a fantastic success for their mode of engagement with politics less than what they wanted. What they wanted, they got, but they got because of a series of accidents, namely World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II. Because at the end of that, you couldn't turn around to the working class and say, right, you, back to the factories, go on, get in, you've got no rights. No, there was communism, there was an alternative. It was called, be nice to us or we'll shoot you, right? And that was happening all the way through Europe at the end of the war. So up against the wall, you can make them you know, conform, right? That's it. So they got lucky. But what was more important is the whole notion of Fabian. So Fabian was, of course, the Roman general. And the Roman general's strategy was, I don't fight wars of position. I fight wars of movement. I'm constantly shadow boxing. I'm looking for the south paw. I'm always on the back heel. I'm on the back heel, and then I'm going forward. I'm making you off balance. And what they did was to apply that to the way you do politics, which is something, again, that I think particularly the Democrats have forgotten, that what you do is you don't go head on. You go around the side and you sucker punch them. Right? You learn where their weaknesses are and you exploit them. And the very last thing you do is get into a pitched battle against the superior force because you will always lose. That's what Fabian taught the military. And what Fabianism taught politics was the inevitability of gradualness. These tiny little steps that accumulate, and one day you wake up, you're in a very different place because of all these tiny things that have happened. What's happened here has been our Fabianism done by the right. We will have a little bit of this, and the government's too big, and unions are too powerful, and da 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 and one day you wake up in the gig economy, you spent $70,000 on your education, and you've got four jobs, and you're going, what the hell happened? 
and you're looking at a bunch of people who voted for all that, which is us lot, but not actually us, but our demographic, right? And, you, and they have every right to say to us, what the hell did you do? Probably not in this country, but Thatcher managed to do it with only a tiny bit of racism. Who did? Mrs. Thatcher. Oh, right. right? You know, so it's not just, this is why I have real problems with the Trumps all, Trump guys are all racist. This is just dog whistle politics. This is the southern strategy reinvented, whatever. No, there's some of that, of course, that is endemic to the American political culture, right? But it's not all of it. I wonder what percentage. I don't know. I don't know, and I don't know if you'd be any more progressive yeah. in the absence of that. That's a really interesting question. So as we uh, inevitably draw toward a close, um, I think one of the, one of the, the things that has, has emerged from this conversation organically is the overwhelming importance of narrative in, uh, in political culture and in the movement of history. One side creates a narrative that's compelling, that seems to have some kind of emotional currency. If the other side can't match it, or can't fight against it, or can't create a counter-narrative that's equally compelling, then they get wiped out, even if they have facts on their side, mm -hmm. even if they have the truth on their side, even if they have buckets of evidence And what, on did, their what, side. Did, what did Shaw create? Shaw creates narrative. That's why we're still talking about a play that was produced all those years ago, because it's the narrative that matters. He's showing us things through narrative, not through the deck. Under my administration, 7.2%. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. They care about the story, because we feel politics. Well, that's a perfect note to end on. So once again, uh, Thank you very much to, uh, to Mark Blythe, and, and thank you very much to the Fells School of Government here at the University of Pennsylvania. And go see Mrs. Warren's profession. <laughs>